Great. Barry, seriously, man, it's been a long time coming, this interview, this conversation that we're going to have today. Okay. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, it seriously has been actually, but it's an absolute pleasure. I can't, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to talk to me, you know, for class well, time, really, seriously. Come on, of course. No, no, there's all like minded good. people, mm. like minded people working in parallel. So, mm. you know, it's inevitable that at some point the roads will do this well, <laughs> and come so, together. So, so. so. Yeah, Barry, I've got to say, seriously, I don't know if you know this. I mean, I wanted to make you make it clear, and obviously to the to the viewers as well, that you basically you inspired me. Maybe you know you probably inspired loads of people. But when you did your started doing conversations with BTM Club and all that stuff online, you know, I I would never have done these interviews before. I would never even considered it. But when I saw you doing that and everything else, and I saw because I, I like to interviews whereby I'm sitting in front of a person, I've got a camera, like I would love to be in your living room right now. You know, filming you with a camera, but that's you know the pandemic. That would be fabulous. Things. Yeah, the pandemic exactly. But when I saw what you could do and how brilliant you were, I thought myself, you know what? That's that should be. You know, we should all kind of want to do better for ourselves. So you were an absolute role model in me doing what I'm doing today. So I just want to thank you for that. Okay. Wow. Well, that's that's a wonderful start. And there was me going to say thank you for asking me, mm. <laughs> and you know. Yeah, honored to participate, to be honest. But, well, I think that's the purpose of, or should be the purpose of whatever you do to, to make a difference and, and inspire and touch people positively. So I'm really glad to hear that it's touched you positively and, yeah, inspired you to do something else. Because, I mean, you were involved in interviews. Mm. Um, but, not, but not online, not online interviews. Right, I mean, I, okay. Know, that takes a whole different level of courage. It's a different, you know, you know, it's like you're like learning. You've got, you've oh, I think it's more courage. You need more courage to deal with the person face to face in person. You feel um, like, okay, okay. Yeah, I definitely having done both because mm. the first series I did was the Live Well with Barry series, which mm. was, you know, in person. And as you said, well, then lockdown came and changed all of that. So as they say, needs must, and you make what you've mm. got work in the situation. So, mm. but as I said, I'm really thrilled to hear that you have found it an inspiration to do something else. So thank you very much for that. Absolutely. No, it was. But look, you were in your funky shades. You're a man of yes, fashion. I'm not sure you want to see what's under there. Christmas. Okay. Bad, been, what, not, what are we talking not about? Too bad. You look at the state of me, you look at the state of me. But you know. <laughs> not <back> too bad. <laughs> For a 50-something, I mean, sorry, a 30-something-year-old. <laughs> yeah, 90. I'm 90 years old. Come on, man. Oh, yeah, please. I've lived long. You're not even 90 the, kilos. The vampiric, the the vampiric blood, the vampiric blood that no one knows about, and the habits at night. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly. But anyway, okay, so let me start this off, because I want to ask you a question about you, obviously, in terms of how you look and everything else, because you are, you were a model. If, I don't know if you're still a model, but you were a model. Okay? Oh, good Lord, no. And you were a model basically during a time, obviously, you know, 90s, 80s, 90s. You know, you would have been, at that point in time, being a black model, you would have been like a black celebrity. Literally, you'd have been a celebrity at that point. What was that experience like for you? Well, I, I mean, I think you became aware of the celebrity status <laughs> after. Yeah. Um, because, as you know, fashion, music, film are very connected. So you would find yourself in the same places as these people. You would find yourself in the same parties, the so same social gatherings, you know, as these people who you thought were celebrities, the, the actors and actresses and musicians. And you're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? You know, <laughs> but um, yeah, they were in interconnected. And I think for me personally, I found that kind of celebrity status after, you know, you would go to clubs and you didn't have to queue. You would go to places and you were on the guest list and things like that. But um, the initial going into modeling for me was just, oh, I can do that. Well, they're doing it. Let me give it a try. It was never something I was pursuing, maybe differently from other models who you know, really wanted to make it big. It was just another thing that I tried and thought, yeah, this could be fun. 
Mm. Have yeah. I taken you off track? <laughs> no, not at all. No, no, not at all. But, you know, but for me, obviously, when I look back at that time, obviously in the nineties, I mean, I was an, I was a nineties boy. So, so for me, I knew, I knew exactly what it was like. And like Nick Kamen, you know, the models of that period, they were like literally any door would open up. You, if you watch, you know, if you're on TV or on a music video overnight, you were like, everyone was talking about you. You were like the big deal. Cause it was on everything. It was on all the time on MTV. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I mean, people talk about the racism now. I don't know if I should bring this up. They talk about the racism that exists now. Mm. But, you know, it was always there. But the thing for me is the perseverance. So we never let it deter us. We never let it break us down. We just kept going. We mm. just kept going and kept going. Mm. And eventually, you know, we got to where or as far as we could get with the circumstances and what was going on at the time. And I think you kind of had to have a vision as to, well, it's time to get out now because mm. I think I've got as far as I can go, mm. you know, yeah. with the prejudices that existed. Mm. So, yeah. But, you'd be but it was a fun you, time. Yeah, but ultimately you would have been breaking barriers as well. That's the thing. So for what you were doing, you were leading other people to, again, you're inspiring people to move forward and say, okay, actually we can do it too. And that, that's what it's about. That's kind of where I'm leading with this. Right. Well, yes. I mean, we, most of the black models here in the UK, in London in particular, I should say, mm. were under the guidance of somebody called Clive Johnson and a very good friend of Lee Johns. Mm. And, um, you know, he, he was international. He was all over Europe, the States. And he saw that potential in us. He didn't give us a warning as to what we were up against, but he saw the potential in us and thought, yes, they can do this. And I mean, we were standing on the shoulders of people like him, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's how the generations go. The, the, the models now that came after us were standing on our shoulders. Mm. And, and so it should move on. But, you know, we were kicking doors down and we were moving in a different way mm. and he brought the realization of what was possible. And we just thought, hell yeah, let's try it. Let's give it a try. No fear, no fault of any obstacles. <laughs> just let's do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So you went from then there on to becoming a radio presenter. Okay, at some point you transitioned into radio presenting. What was the expectation for you as a black radio presenter? Or was there no expectation at all? There was no expectation. Between modeling and fashion, I kind of went into music. Mm. Was with um, EMI at one stage with Kim Appleby. Um, well, you're and, not, so you, you're saying you're an artist? You're an artist? Yes, I dabbled in that. You know, that's that's the, the bizarre thing of Barry Thomas's journey. Up, man. i got to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I so knew there was something more to you. I see, I thought, because you know so much about music. I'm like, this guy knows so much about music. He's like, where does this come from? It's like, it doesn't, that doesn't come from... Yeah, I mean... Fact. No, I, uh, the, the interest in music comes from the family. Everybody in my family are musically involved. My mother played the piano. My father was originally an opera singer. My brother, who's 10 years my senior, was always buying music. I think the first record I bought was Family Affair by Sly Family Stone. And I was seven years old, you know, my pocket money, that's what it was going towards. Mm. So that musical interest was always there. But kind of, as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the connections between fashion, music, acting, act, they're, they're very close. And mm. I kind of moved, transitioned from fashion into music. And as I said, I was with Kim Appleby, signed to EMI, um, was also with another group called LA Mix, which was signed to a and Records. Wow. And again, you know, just yeah. another one of the transition yeah. things that Barry Thomas's life Love is. It. And it. I did it for as long as I was enjoying it. And then it was all getting a bit too, mm. you no, know, not for me. Time mm. to move on to something else. Mm. <laughs> Love it. But the original question, sorry for taking you off piece. Um, the original question was, what were my expectations as a mm. radio presenter? Mm. I had no expectations other than wanting to share my love of music with people. Mm, mm. 
That's the, that was the only thing I wanted to do. And it wasn't even an expectation. It was just, uh, I wanted to share my love of music. But then mm. even again, just going and playing a playlist and not making it anything historical, archival, if mm. full of information, mm. to me is pointless. So I wanted to use the platform then to, well, no, I wouldn't say educate people about music, mm. but I just wanted to make my show mm. a little, or shows a little different from some of the others, which is just playing a playlist. Mm. I wanted to tell people a bit about the artists, their background, mm. and, you know, how they got to where they are doing what they're doing. Mm. Uh, and that was, that was it. So it, it was a progression. I just thought, just going on every week and playing a playlist of music, you know, other people are doing that. They've heard the tunes before. There's something else you have to do to make it a bit more interesting. Mm. So that was it for me. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about, you see, basically you're talking about the idea where you were doing this stuff, doing your shows, but you also, you actually relating this to your interviews in, in conversation with, is that what you're talking about? Well, I, I, the in conversation started during lockdown, but mm. before that, I started bringing the artists to the radio station. Oh, okay, okay. So, so I had the show, yeah, mm. I had the shows first, mm. but then mm. I thought, you know, I've got these connections to people like Bob James, mm. Harvey Mason, Dexter Wansell, mm. Chris Jasper. Why not let them? Have, and, and at that stage, it was phone conversations, you know what I mean? So we were interviewing on the phone and recording it, and then the producer would edit it. I have a great producer, Ivoretti, and I have to say. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, you know, so that's how it started. But I always wanted it to be something slightly more than just playing a playlist, mm -hmm. you know. So that's how that started. I started bringing the, the artists that people love to the station, Mm -hmm. They would tell their story about the tracks that we love and how they mm -hmm. came about. And that was that was that. So what subjects were you trying to flesh out? Was there anything that you thought beyond that, which is a bit more poignant, maybe to the community or people generally? Well, to me, as you say, whatever you do, it's always about the inspiration. Mm -hmm. It's always about inspiring somebody and leaving something. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear how these people got to where they are, how it started for them. Because I think that is what the inspirational mm. part mm. is. Mm. The people who want to get into the industry now realize that, well, no, it didn't just happen overnight. I didn't just wake up and decide I wanted to be a top 10 star, a number one star or musician. It took time. And some of these artists were plying their trade, honing their trade for 20 years before Absolutely. we even heard yeah. about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. like the Sounds of Blackness. Mm. So, you know, we heard about the Sounds of Blackness in 1991, mm. but they started in 1971. Wow. So it's 20 years, you know, that was the mm. journey before they met Jam and Lewis mm. to Optimistic, which came out in 1991. So I think that's what's the inspiration in mm. the story, you know? Come and tell the story. Let people know, you know, that it doesn't happen overnight and not to give up. And because it doesn't happen overnight, you shouldn't just throw it in and, and give up and just go and do a regular job. Because if you're really an artist and the first thing you think about is music or the first thing you think about is whatever, that's what you should be doing. Mm. But understand that it's not going to happen overnight. So that's really what it, um, what it was about. That's what I wanted to flesh out. Mm. And I always say to them, you know, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to know if you've been arrested. I don't want to know if you've got any <laughs> drugs charges. That's not what this is mm. about. Mm. This mm. is about uplifting. Mm. This is about inspiring people and, and celebrating the artist. Mm. So, you know, I'm not there to embarrass them and dig the dirt and what happened, you know, when they were young. And that's not what it's about. I want to know just about the music and, mm. and that's it. I hear you. But the thing is, in terms of, you know, if you're talking about how things were for people back in the day and how they worked really hard to get to where they were, the stimulus is so different now. I mean, if you're back in the day, we weren't, we weren't surrounded by media. We weren't, you know, we could dump a paper, never read it and not know anything about it. We could just not watch the news and we wouldn't know anything. Whereas now it's yeah. everybody's on their phone. So they can see if, you know, if you're not, if you're not famous, if you're not 
recognized if you're not anywhere near where you should be if you're not signed to a company it's 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 pretty much banging on your door all the time the expectation to achieve that stress so young people today that's why they want it that's why i believe they're, they're pushing so they're pushing for it so quickly rather than saying okay let's just apply our trade take our time I think that is very much a reflection of now, life now, full stop, whether it be music, whatever. Whatever we want, it's at the fingertips. And that has nurtured an impatience and entitlement in people, which is really quite ugly, <laughs> you know. And, and the thing is, half the time, all of these figures that you're supposed to be gauging your life against are false. They've bought them. They've bought the followers. For me, I would rather have less followers mm. and people that are really interested in what you're doing rather than buying 10,000 followers so that your page looks like you're really popular. Mm. But yeah, there are people that aren't even engaging with you. Mm. Um, yes, the industry has changed, and that's one of the reasons why I... I started the In Conversation series mm. because I was using these artists' music to get me through lockdown, basically. For the first time in years, I was actually dusting off my vinyl and playing it again, <laughs> you know? Um, so I then thought, I wonder what they're doing. <laughs> I wonder what they're using to get down. And I just reached out to a couple of them and you know, they were, yes, I'd love to tell this story and whatever, and talk about how the industry has changed. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know what, this is quite a special thing here because a lot of these artists that we knew because the, art, the, the industry has changed, mm -hmm. the money isn't thrown at them in the way that it was from record companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are self-publishing their stuff you know, and you're going to concerts with these legends and they're sitting at a table selling CDs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's how the industry has changed. And you're realizing, well, these legends may well fall through the cracks mm -hmm. <laughs> because of how the industry has changed. So, yeah, you know, that was it, really. I just thought these legends need to be celebrated. Their stories need to be told. And explain how the industry has changed from their time, what it is now. And, you know, everything is figures and everything is handles and, and shares. And half the time, even when you see they're making these huge shares mm. and streams, they're not even making that much money. Mm. So, you know, know a lot of them are saying, sorry. You know what? That, and that's a real shame. It's an absolute shame. You know, it's, it's absolutely. A lot, yeah. And that's, and that's why I want to come to this question with you. And I was going to talk to you about this later, but I want to bring it up now. It could be going along this, this, you know, this, this line of stuff. Um, where do you see black music going? Where do you see if you're looking at the, the legends almost being forgotten? And that's you know, because I mean when I listen to your show, seriously, BFM, I listen to your music, it's phenomenal. I don't get enough time to watch it because I've got so many other things going on, but I love, I really love your shows. I wouldn't listen to your radio. I wouldn't be trying to interview you if I didn't think your stuff was fantastic, really, seriously. And I love Thank the way you, so you speak. Much. I love the way you speak. I love the way you represent us. We represent our people and people of walks. I know this isn't about just being black. It's about, yeah. it's about everybody. It's about being brothers and sisters of the world. That's how I look at it. But, Absolutely. But, but at the same time, you still, from an, from, from an outside perspective, if I didn't know you and I saw you and I, and I didn't be, you know, I wasn't on that mindset. I would be thinking, wow, this guy is really making us look good. Okay. So in terms of the music and where things are going, where do you see the current trends? How do you feel black music is going to look or be in the next five, 10 years? You know, that that is a really difficult question because mm. music has always evolved and it's always changed. So, you know, if you're talking about music from Scott Joplin days in the mm. 20s, to bebop in the 40s, to rock and roll in the 50s, mm. to, you know, Motown and Stax. And you see, music has always evolved. I think the difference is now, sadly, music is artificially created. Mm. So rather than you having a string section, a horn section, your backing vocalist, the majority of stuff now is computer generated. Mm. And 
I, I think that that is the loss. And I interviewed a, a great artist called um, Eric Griggs, mm -hmm. who's worked with Dr. Dre and a, a British group actually called mm -hmm. Floetry, who went to the States and made it big. And the last picture he put up on his socials was in a studio, Phil Spector style, mm. with Tina Turner mm. and Wall of Sound. Do you remember that? Mm. Full orchestra. And he's younger than us. Mm. So he was so excited to, to be working with full band, full orchestra. Mm. And when you see that, you realize there is hope. Because if there's somebody of his generation that still understands the value of a full band, a full mm. orchestra, your backing vocalists, your percussions, whatever, your strings, your horns, it gives you hope that it's not completely lost. Mm. That in addition to most of what you're listening to now that sounds good mm. is sampled from the old tunes. Mm. The sad thing is they don't even realize it's sampled from Tom mm. Brown, yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> you know? And that's where the history lessons come in. So, yeah, but, is it, but is it only about that? Isn't it about as well about the message? Because you can, the message. You, can still, you can play instruments all day long, but still the message might just not be right. And the message, that's what I'm on about. Yeah, the, friends. Not just the, the message. Not, the, not just the artistry, but in terms of, you know, just what are they saying? What, how's that going to affect people overall? You know, what, because the message does affect people. It does affect people. And I, I mean, being an oldie, I can only harp back to times when things were, you know, you think mm. about civil rights mm. movement in the 60s. Mm. Think of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On album as relevant today, 50 years later, mm. as it was then mm. with the things that are going on. The message is important. I don't know what the message is now when I listen to new mm -hmm. music, as it were, from the younger generation. I'm not entirely sure what the message is. It sounds very aggressive. It sounds very hostile. And, <laughs> you know, in our time, it was just talking about love and come on, let's get together. We need to sort this out. We need to come mm -hmm. together. Oh, but it sounds very aggressive to my old ears. Mm -hmm. um, so... I don't know what the message is, to be honest. Mm. And that's just a personal thing. I'm not saying that my <laughs> word is final. I'm just saying that's a personal thing. I'm not entirely sure mm. what the message is. Yeah, well, obviously, that's the point. The message has to be, you know, the future, whatever the current trends are going to be, we hope that the message is going to be better than it is today. Because yeah, you know, uh, and as I said, you use those examples of, like Marvin Gaye's album, it's as relevant now with wars and racism. And because that was in the height of the civil movement, end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. You know, so you realize that, yeah, the message is important, but the people who are making the music have to really be making the message relevant mm. and relevant in a way that everybody can appreciate it, not just one age group or not just one section that is what i find is lacking mm. whereas we had a broad appreciation of music so no we weren't in dinah washington's era but we knew who she was and his contribution mm. to music i find the younger generation are very insular they know what's going on in their box mm. but if you throw these names at them i mean names not even that far away like marvin gay i keep paying reference to and stevie <laughs> You know, they have no idea. They have no idea who they are. Mm. Mm. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, well, well, I'm, well, the thing is, obviously, the aim for me and everybody else should be to let these young people see and understand a little bit more about their heritage and where music came from and why it was so important and how it, what it did for us. But anyway, based Absolutely. on what I can see behind me, in front of you, so I can see in your room, you, you know, you seem like a very cultured man. Okay, so I'm quite privileged. You sound like a very cultured man. Do I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you're absolutely. Culture, okay. But the culture, you know, culture is all about how we live and everything else. Okay, so, you know, how we represent ourselves and all sorts of things. What does culture mean to you? Okay. How important is culture to you? Culture is extremely important, for whether it be your history, 
your music, your food, but I think culture is also paying reverence to other cultures apart from your own. And that makes your world bigger. It makes you a better rounded adult. It makes you understand that just because I do things that way or people in my culture do things that way doesn't mean it's the only way. Mm. So for me, culture is about the appreciation mm. and celebration of everybody's culture, the respect of everybody's mm. culture, learning about other people apart from just yourself. Mm. and how you cook chicken or how you cook peas and rice and and that has to be the ultimate mm. no mm. it doesn't <laughs> do you know what i mean no i don't want to eat jerk chicken and peas and rice every time i go out mm. <laughs> i i'm quite happy to to eat mm. other things mm. you know but it, that that is what culture means to me but your own personal culture in spite of respecting other peoples and mm. welcoming other peoples you should have high regard for yours and and mm. and you share that proudly you should share your culture proudly with people and respect others and receive it that's mm. what culture means to me good fantastic well look i'm a great supporter of a black middle class okay whatever that means to you i believe it offers the right building blocks for positive contribution to society what's your thoughts right. on that black middle class well you Define that first before I go any further. What does that mean to you? Well, a black middle class to me is basically, if you think about it as a working class, what we have what we have in our society right now is we have an idea of a subculture. So, for example, we look at when people think about black people and have for so long, it's always seemed more likely to be part of that subculture. OK, like there is no beyond the working class level in, in society. If you go to Jamaica, you'll see there are different classes is the upper classes, the middle classes. Absolutely. Is, you know, it's, this is what we understand to be normal. But if someone like myself, we never went, oh, sorry, I went, to, I went to Jamaica later on in life. Prior to that, the only black people I saw were of the working classes. And that's not negative in any shape or form. My parents grew up in the UK in that. My, my dad was a painting decorator. So for me, that's what I, right. as well as an artist, but that's what I saw, okay? So what happened was, right. ideally what happened, uh, what could have happened, should have happened, is I should have wanted to achieve more, but I didn't want to achieve more. I wanted to achieve more in a negative way rather than in a positive way. So for me, the, I, I needed to see more. And that's what a black middle class would have presented for me. Seeing black people as doctors, you know, as teachers, you know, more than the sort of train drivers. So that's what I'm talking about. How important is it to have a black middle class which represents us in a positive way? Well, I think it is very important. I think it's very important to... Because, as you said, everywhere there are different classes. Not everybody is in the same class. And that's what I take umbrage about when, you know, we are spoken about. It's like, well, you're all black people. You're all just the same. Mm. No, we're not all just the same. It's a question of the middle class. You're always trying to do better. Mm. And you know, within our culture, and this is probably going to be controversial, when we do try to do better, who you think you are? You think you're too nice. You think you're better than whatever. So there's almost that thing saying, well, you've just got to keep perpetuating the same thing. Don't mm. try for anything else. Mm. And I actually say to people, well, you know, when, tell me when you think I've strived or achieved enough before I get above my station. Mm. When do you think I should stop trying? <laughs> you know but but the middle class I, I i don't know my parents my mother was a nurse my mm. father was an accountant they tried to do their best for us they tried mm. to, to as you used the word earlier give us a cultured palate so we were always out at restaurants that would take us to the theater mm. they would take us places so that mm. we were seeing the world from a young age more than just what was around us mm. but that doesn't didn't mean that we couldn't sit down on the sofa and eat some fried chicken as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it was just letting you know that there's more out there for mm -hmm. you. And there's no such thing as, oh, that's not for me. My father being an opera singer when he first came here from Trinidad, he was very much into opera. So he would take us to mm -hmm. see Maria Callas. Didn't even know who she was at the time until, you know, years after you then realized she was a don and he took us to see her at the festival hall. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. it, it's those things. I, I just think the middle class, 
you you open your mind, open your mind to what is beyond your community and what is just there. Because mm. there's no one out there saying that you can't participate in everything. Go mm. and learn to ride a horse. Go and learn to play golf. Go to the opera. There's no one stopping you. Go to the theater. Mm. The only thing stopping you from doing those things are you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's also, my brother, it's also about being recognised as a middle class because I don't think there is recognition of a black middle class in the UK. I don't even care about that, to be honest. And when you mm. say recognised, recognised by who? Who is the person? Recognised by body? society. I mean, if, I, if I go up and ask somebody, yeah, I, 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 I've had I, these conversations. I've, had, I've spoken to people. Yeah. And they said to me, no, there isn't one. Because I told you, because their viewpoint is that we black people are the subcultures and are, are the working classes and there's there isn't no movement beyond that and that's not, so it becomes a psychological trap and i think that's where we find ourselves where young black stuck. people find themselves yeah stuck yeah because it's like well that's, I, you can't get you can't do anymore like you talked about our own people saying don't be uppity don't you know don't, your, your, of, your own people yeah, you know that kind of house you're house. a sellout yeah all yeah. these terms that we hmm. we we embrace in our mm. community as common language mm. what does that mean mm. <laughs> do you know what i mean where are you supposed to stop mm. but for me i i don't really care if anybody recognizes me as any <laughs> anything that's the honest to god's truth mm. i i've stopped with all that nonsense mm. of worrying about what people think of me because you'll always mm. find the negative even mm. when you're trying to do something mm. positive mm. So I don't care about that. I just live mm. my life the way I think I should. So I, I will mm. go to a, a, I'll tell you a classic example. I went to the opera house in Covent Garden. From there, I went directly to the roughest shabine you could mm. ever imagine <laughs> in Wilsdon. Wilsdon mm. it was. And for me, it's a, life is about the journey. It's about the versatility. I can go to that Shubin and have a good time, but I can go to the opera and have a good time. Mm. Make your world broad. Mm. Mm. That's all I can say. Don't Definitely. limit yourself. There's no one stopping you from doing anything you want to do. Do mm. it. Mm. Don't care about what anybody thinks about you or how they feel about you. As long mm. as you're not harming people mm. or doing things with an ulterior motive, mm. live your life and just don't worry about what people mm think you should do do what you think you should want to do for yourself but mm. the only advice i can say to people is don't because there are people putting a glass ceiling on you mm. don't mm. put it on yourself mm. don't put that ceiling on yourself mm. you know all the time you've got to be breaking that ceiling and then mm. knocking down the limitations because there are enough people out there thinking you know come mm. on you're getting above your station stop there mm. Mm. You know? mm. yeah <laughs> you know? absolutely absolutely and i love that i love that about you i love that and you 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 present that when you're doing your shows. But can I ask something as well? You come across and you know you are, you're a strong personality, right? You're a strong personality. And I love that. I love that. But no, you are. Everything you just said there is that you don't care. You do what you want to do. That's a strong personality. Do you ever, okay. when you do your interviews, okay, do you ever have to hold back on that personality? No, no, I don't. What I find is each artist brings something different out in you. But whichever on whoever I'm speaking with, mm. I'm always me. Mm. I'm always me. I don't have to temper it down. I don't have to tailor it. I don't have to, you know, I, I'm me. But what every artist brings something different out mm. in you. One of the most inspirational interviews I did was Gary Hines of Sounds of Blackness. Mm. Mm. And in this interview, I was getting choked up because you realize yeah, I was getting choked up because the conversation was so deep. It wasn't mm. just about, it wasn't just about, you know, well, I'm in this group and they're fabulous. And they're, mm -hmm. he was talking about the journey mm. and the civil rights movement and how they have protested through their music all along. Mm. All along they protested through their music. And you realize that the sounds of blackness literally work like a family. So you find that the people that were in there in the 70s, their children or grandchildren are now in the Sounds of Blackness. Mm -hmm. Alexander O'Neill was oh. in there and, and Nesby. 
Mm. But, you know, the depth with which he spoke, it was more than just about me being a performing fabulous person. Mm. Mm. It was about we've got to inspire people to do something different. Mm. And mm. Beautiful. Yes. Sorry again to go off piece. You see, once you get me talking, it doesn't stop. No, but I, love, no, but I love it. Thank you. <laughs> mm. But um, he was saying uh, when George Floyd was killed, it was two blocks from where the Sounds of Blackness rehearse. And he came out and there was all this going on in the street and somebody recognized him and said, oh my God, we love the Sounds of Blackness and, you know, we love your music, but, you know, we hope that your next single isn't as passive as mm. it was oh. in the past. Mm. You know, I, mm. we hope that your next single is is really more direct mm. and mm -hmm. and open about the racism and reparations. And if you see all this stuff that they're doing now, that's exactly what he took on board. Mm. Because as he said, he was always and the Sons of Blackness were always protesting and mm. civil rights movement protesters, mm. but in a more gentle mm. way. But mm. after that event, you know, mm. it was really more forceful and aggressive and. And that's exactly what they've done. But, you know, talking to him, I get choked up now talking about it because it was such a moving interview. Mm. And, and then some of them are so funny, like Will Downing. I mean, from the time we put the thing on, we were shrieking in tears, mm. <laughs> you know? So I never have to temper my personality down. My personality, I'm just me. I think people have kind of got to know that now. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, each <laughs> yeah. artist does bring something different out in you. Mm. And I just go accordingly, but I'm never mm. having to to hold back, as it were. No, no, because I, I love those Facebook posts that you put out. You know, you just got a lot of stuff you say, especially when you kind of go from back and forth in your Papua accent, <laughs> you know, which I can't do. That's I mean, you right. Do you do it so well. I mean, it's like, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what I'm Jamaican or I've got Jamaican roots, but I can tell you now, I cannot even go near that people will laugh at me if i try to do a jamaican accent even, <laughs> well you know i think it is it is really how our parents our grandparents mm. our aunts and uncles would have said things mm. and i just write it in that way and then go into english and and what i love is i look at the people that that engage mm. and you're seeing black white old young so they're totally getting it because yeah. now we live in a, a society mm. Mm. that they're hearing it in music they're hearing it on the streets mm. whereas if i was to probably write that in the 70s mm. i'd need to have a translation book they'd have no idea <laughs> you know but um brilliant. yeah i just write about life and write it the way we would say it mm. brilliant i'm gonna put you on a spot now would you say okay. that america is more gifted musically than the uk Hmm. Uh, that is difficult for the simple reason America is so much bigger hmm. it is so much bigger than the UK and exposed to so many hmm. different things so many more things than the, than the UK are exposed hmm. to so I don't know that they are more talented I just think they're more of them hmm. Brilliant. Um, so consequently, they're exposed mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to more. The different states creates different reactions yeah, to each of those people. The mm. different states. Exactly. So mm. I, I don't know. I just think there are more of them. And they are hugely, amazingly talented. And I mean, you when you, again, interviewing these people, mm. you go, New York is like this hub of, of greatness. Mm. That, <laughs> So many of the artists come from New York mm. and Chicago mm. and L.A. So, you know, they're little pockets that actually seem to be nurturing these amazing artists. But, um, yes, I, I, they're definitely exposed to more. Mm. And as I was saying, when you hear how tap dancing was created, it mm. was the Black American jazz with the Irish dancing mm. combined in New York. Hey, wow. So, you know, when you hear stories like that, you mm. realize, and that's how it is, you know, like Michael Flatley, mm. um, the Irish dancing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That combined with jazz is what created <laughs> tap dancing. And when you hear stories like that, you just say, yeah, this mm. is, it's a special place. But, you know, there's great talent here, no doubt about it. Whether they get the recognition they should is, is the question, but there's mm. definitely great talent here. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. For a lot of us, 
All right, right now, we've, you know, it's been a pandemic. There isn't a lot to smile about. What keeps you smiling? What keeps me smiling? <laughs> the fact that I can do things like that. I, I feel gifted and blessed that I can do the job I do that mm. I love. And I'm not going to work feeling miserable. Mm. I've got a wonderful husky who's sleeping mm. on the sofa over there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've seen the pictures. Beautiful. Beautiful. Huh? I've seen the pictures. Yeah. I, I didn't... I didn't know. I didn't know if he was uh, your dog, or initially, or one of your a relatives' dog. Yeah. I think you, I think you mentioned once that it was your brother's. No, dog. No, he's my thought, dog. It was your dog? Okay, okay. Wow. No, no it's my dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. I mean, there's so many things. Friends, just being able to talk on the phone and chat rubbish, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and I think, and it sounds like a cliche, I guess. It really is the thing of starting in a place of gratitude. Once you start in a place of gratitude, there's no room for anything else. Mm. And it's taken me a while to get there. The pandemic has got me there. Mm. I have a 96-year-old mother who is is still running the house like a tyrant. Mm. And, you know, so all of those things you look back on and you go, Mm. well, yeah, you know. Mm. You've got lots to be grateful for. Mm. And sometimes it is hard going. It is heavy going. But ultimately, mm. you know, music makes me mm. smile. Mm. Food makes me smile. I love food. I'm mm. passionate about my food. Mm. So, you know, something as simple as a good meal makes me smile. Mm. <laughs> Definitely. Well, no, you know what? But obviously everyone here in this, there you go. This has been, that seems to be the key to happiness. Music and food, and I can, I get it. Whenever I put on a good song, it does change my mood. But I, again, if I put on a song that's negative, and I spoke to a few people, and I said that they use music to change their moods. But if they, if they're, if they're angry. They want to listen to angry music. Whereas if I'm, I feel angry. I want to put on positive music to bring me up. I don't want to be angry. Exactly. Hmm. I don't want to hear I'm going to pop you, and I'm going to do this. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Give me some earth, wind, and fire. Let me fling my hands in the air. Do you remember? Yeah. Let me, <laughs> you know. Right, so you've got, you've got um, an event that you put on. Was it BTM Reunited? Is that like a... a Reunited, like a yeah, month, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again. Monthly or, or monthly or how is it? How, when do you have it? Oh, now it's, it's tri-monthly. I'm too old for monthly. When I started it 13 years ago, wow. another one of the things wow. that I do. Wow. <laughs> Um, when I started it 13 years ago, it was monthly. Mm. Um, but increasingly, as I got busier with other things mm. and doing other things, you know, it, it's it's a lot to do. But again, that started from a place of, you know what? Mm. Let's get together and network. We've all gone out, gone our separate ways, mm. lived our lives, become established in our respective fields. Mm. Let's come together and see what we can create. You know, let's come together in a place, in a space that we know what we're going to get. We know the standard and quality of what we're going to get musically, company, like-minded mm. people, you know. Mm. So, yeah, that's how that started. So that was just another one of the things I do. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, great. Fantastic. But look, I'll ask another question. In your opinion, are we becoming a more positive, open society? And if not, how can we become one? Well, a more positive society. Are we becoming well, more open? I, Are we becoming more open? Are we becoming more positive? And if not, how can we become one? I don't really know. I think there's still there are people who are, are very open. And I don't think it, it's really becoming. Those things have always existed. There have always been the people who are very open and welcoming and inclusive and always will be the people who aren't. Mm. I don't think that ever changes. Um, And as for positivity, they're the people who, again, another cliche, glass half full or half empty. There'll Mm. always be those people. There will always be those people. I don't think it's changing in any one direction or another. I just think the ball continues to roll. The positive people in with the negative, the opening with the close, and it's just who you gravitate towards. Mm. You know, I will always say to people, try and gravitate towards people mm. with positive energy because mm-hmm. you can't have a positive life with negative thoughts, whether it be about things or other people mm. or most mm. importantly about yourself. 
Mm. You can't have a positive life with negative thoughts. You mm. always have to try and find the positive in situations, mm. you know? So I love that. I love that stoicism. I love it. And that's the thing. And that's what I want people to pick up and get from you is that just, you know, how do we get to that point where we're as happy and as positive as you seem to be? And that's what you give out. That's what you basically, you know, fuse quite, you know, to the to us when we when we listen to your shows. You know, and that's kind of, you know, it's like if I'm a, if I'm a certain way and I, and I want to be a certain way and I want to sell that fine. But I love what you're selling to us all. Do you understand? And that's what I want. And that's why I wanted this interview. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and there are days when I am not on top of the world because nobody can be on top of the world all the time. Mm. But it's certainly not my job to 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 give that to other people. Mm. I always uh, my my mantra is when people have had an encounter with you, mm. they should be better off having had that encounter with you not need therapy mm. they shouldn't <laughs> you know what i mean people yeah. shouldn't need therapy after they've had an encounter mm. with you mm. and if they do there's something wrong with you mm. <laughs> you know yeah. so yeah you know not every day am i on top of the world no but in the days that i'm not i'm certainly not um going to to put that on to other people and mm. certainly not when i'm mm. at work that's not what mm. they're turning on to listen to mm. that's not what they're turning on mm. to see and mm. the simple fact that you're in that space doing mm. something that's positive and inspirational mm. changes your mood mm. you know yeah. it changes your mood mm. wonderful so it's like a bit of an elixir absolutely something that we can't all have but i'm yeah. gonna go to your back to your passion of food you have a real passion for food <laughs> You have a real passion for foods. I want us to, you know, I, and I need that because trust me, I, I, it's been for many years of my life, I've not really, I've not liked food. Okay. I've, I've just, I've not liked food. I'm being honest with everyone listening here. Not um, liked just, food? Yeah. I've not, I did, yeah. Because it just, to me, it's hard work. It just seemed like hard work to make it. And my, my mum, <laughs> my mum, yeah, my mum sport me as a kid. So she definitely sport me as a kid, you know, to give me what I wanted. And that was that. But, so I had not had a love for food. And my, even my kids have picked up a lot of that. And I'm working on my children to make sure they have a passion for food as well. Because this is really important. You have a real passion for food. That's obvious from the YouTube videos that you put out. Why is food so important to you? And how can others gain that passion? Well, I mean, it, it's one of the things that we've touched on before about culture. I think food is like traveling. When you eat, it's like traveling. So you go to France, you go to Italy, you go to Spain. <laughs> All of those things should be in your palate at some point in your life's journey. Um, food, I, I'll tell you what it is. We were never taught to cook us stuff, but, you know, the household, as they say, the kitchen is the heart of the house. Those that were cooking would be cooking and you would just be there. They weren't teaching you, but you're seeing. You're absorbing that. And... There's, there's nothing worse than eating something that is disappointing. Mm. Do you know I would rather not eat? Mm. Now, some days <laughs> I am on such a hustle. <laughs> some days I'm on such a hustle that I don't get to, to possibly eat a proper meal in mm. the daytime mm. because I'm running from place to place, doing, organizing, whatever. Mm. But I would rather, on my way home, buy my produce mm. and come home and cook properly mm. then stop somewhere where I see people going into Greg's and mm. can I name places? <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, mm. going into these fast food places to buy mm. rubbish, mm. I, I don't see. Mm. And, you know, eating stuff like that, I guess, is very perfunctory. It just serves its purpose to mm. fill a space. Mm, but mm. there's no enjoyment in it. Mm. For me, when I'm eating, I need to enjoy my food. Mm. I need to enjoy each mouthful. Mm. When I'm eating my food, I'm smiling. Mm. When I'm cooking it, I'm smiling from the time mm. I start to smell it. Mm -hmm. So food is very important to me. It's always been very important in our family. It's always mm. been a time where we come together. And like yourself, mm -hmm. you know, I guess you, the people would say you're spoiled, but I don't see it as being spoiled. I mm. see it as being food is quality family time. Mm. So I have no idea why parents would cook food that they know their children don't like 
and mm. force them to eat it mm. so that dinner time is now this horrendous, mm. horrific experience. Because <laughs> you don't want it. You're screaming. They're, they're crying because you're forcing them to eat it. You are screaming because you want them to eat it. So, you know, I never saw that kind of confusion in my house. Mm. Mm. We, you know, they would find ways to cook things that mm. we like find us ways to cook things that we would like it, mm. that were good for us, that we mm. wouldn't otherwise like, like spinach and things like that. But, you know, it was always a loving time. People always wanted to be in my house because, as mm. you know, we mm. always cook for, if there are four people in the house, you've got to cook for at least 24 mm. in case, mm. <laughs> right? Mm. And there was always an in case because people know, oh, you know, the food in there is mm. sweet. Mm. Yeah, God, let's go, Harry's. So, you know, food has always been a part of my life. So as I said, mm. now mm. it's just an extrapolation of that. I'd rather cook and make sure I've got something good and tasty and wholesome and, you know, than eat rubbish on the way or eat something that is so disappointing that I just throw it in the bin and go to my bed vexed. Mm. <laughs> you know? So okay. yeah, food is very important, as you can see. Yeah. Yeah, it is important, but obviously, in terms of, it's about how you gain that passion. I mean, how does someone, you know, it's like, you, you, there's loads of uh, culinary programs now where you can, about cooking, you know, master yeah. chef, and there's tons of them. You've got your show. I mean, do you, do you, you know, I'm not seeing, I should, maybe I'll put a link on it. Could you send me some links of you cooking? Can you like, so I can look at that. I think it's just more getting to see. How yes, I will. Process. But I'll be honest with you, all the links, all the links that I do with cooking mm. or all the programs I do with cooking, I'm never in it. You mm. never see me. You hear me talking, you see me doing. But I think, you know what, you see my face enough mm. when I'm interviewing people. Mm. So you don't need to see me. It's not about mm. me. It's about the food. Mm. So, but yeah, you know, the thing is, like anything, you have to want to do it. Exactly. It's exactly. nothing. That's it. That's you, it. Yeah. You know, so... You say, how can people get the passion? They can only get the passion if they really mm. want to do it. Mm. And there are many people who only eat food just for sustenance. Mm. They don't really eat it for enjoyment. Mm. You know? and, then, and then they get so, sick. No, when it, when it, Barry, and then they get to a point where they start getting sick when they're in their 40s and they're like, well, I should have yeah. eaten better, you know, and it's, it, and it's too late because they just, but that's the point. You it's know, if you're just eating, if you're just eating fast food, Mm. And, and and well, one of the things I I do is with personal training. So I would cook the clients' food, mm. and and and, oh, and you know I'm mm. I'm saying to them, don't waste time getting a takeout because by the time you've chosen it, you've gone mm. through the menu, chosen it, and you've then waited for the delivery, mm. and then you've paid over the odds for it. Mm. You could have bought something on the way home and cooked it, mm. but it's just the trying. Mm. You have to just try it. I see all these adverts on TV with food boxes mm. being delivered to your house with, with recipes in it. And you could, mm. what are you talking about? Just go and buy your fish. Just go and buy your chicken. Mm. Or if you're a vegetarian, go and buy your food and cook it. I don't need somebody to, to package uh, a product mm, to tell mm. me how to stir fry peppers mm. and charge me eight <laughs> pounds for the <laughs> for <laughs> the privilege yeah. when I'm gonna get the peppers mm. and all the ingredients I'm gonna cook for the mm. eight pounds. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know? It's basic. So it's, so, ba it's all about shopping smart. It's all about so cooking. It's about getting yeah. that mindset to understand you're wasting money. You're wasting a fortune on foolishness mm. on a cardboard box on delivery. And on the produce that you've actually, you're actually getting, you know, it's probably three pounds, which mm. you could have done for yourself. Yeah, mm. but each to his own, you know. But but, but you we show me, always... but you show me the correlation is also a, around fitness. So when you talked about, and that was a bit of a revelation for me, so you were a personal trainer for somebody, you do personal yeah. training. That again, mm. it might bring you back to me. When I, when I, when that time I met you in uh, at this show, Donnie's show. And I went up yeah. and, I gra and I grabbed your arm because I saw a big, a big bicep. Like, What's that? <laughs> hey, you're, you're as big I don't think they're that big. Oh, yeah, that big? I don't know. <laughs> Hercules. Is it big? I don't know. Yeah. yeah so, it's like, so a lot of it's down to if you are being, if you're trying, if you want to be fit, want to take care of your body, then it's more likely that you're going to 
eat better or you should eat better. That's probably what it's about. Yeah, I definitely think that mm. is, is the key for long-term mm. health because, and you know, we can all have a blowout. I'm not really a pizza person mm. or a burger person like that. I just like good mm. quality food. Give me a fish, give me a piece of chicken, give me a piece of meat, mm. whatever. But I think that the, the key to long-term health is mm. eating healthily and there is much truth in you are what you eat mm. so yeah we can all have an occasional blowout but i don't think you can make that kind of of mm. nutrition your daily habit your mm. weekly habit your monthly habit yearly habit mm. because it must have an adverse effect at some point mm. okay fabulous one there's the question i'm gonna end this show on okay it's because obviously we've, we've talked a lot about your music and everything that you've been doing with all these people. And I've seen you, you've talked to so many legendary artists, amazing artists. I mean, I've got a list here, which I, you know, written down, but you've got Steve Arrington from Slave, which everybody knows Slave. I mean, that, God, that, they were, well, not everybody, the, yeah. you probably don't, but most people know how amazing that band was. Heather Small, you know, we know Heather Small, Lorna Gale, we've got Carol Thompson, Eric Griggs, obviously people know Eric Griggs because Dr. Dre and things like that. And that's the, you know, Dr. Dre's a massive name, yeah. you know, so we, we can go there. But all the people that you've interviewed and everything else, and, you know, who would you say was the, you know, the one that you kind of really loved the most? Oh, that's a difficult one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a difficult one. Yeah. That's naughty. That's the, <laughs> you're a yeah. naughty boy. <laughs> it's a naughty boy question. But you know what, you know, but you don't have to answer it. You can say, I don't, I'm not going to do it. But the fact is, you know, I'd like a few little hints. <laughs> Guys, you can tell Mark Anthony, uh, because I've been reprimanded, <laughs> Mark Anthony is a naughty boy. You can tell he's a naughty yeah, boy, can't yeah, you? Put that question. As I said, you know what? Uh, there isn't one. Mm. There isn't one. Mm. Because each one of them brought something mm. different to the table. Mm. I was in awe of Melba Moore because mm. of all that she has achieved. Mm. She had her own series, Melba. She's mm. done Broadway, Tony Awards. You know, she's, she's up there. And she's so open about her story mm. that, again, that is inspiration in itself. And she was here two weeks ago, mm. and we went mm. to see her at the Indigo, 75 and still strutting mm. on that stage doing her stuff. You know, things like that are inspirational. Mm. One mm. difficult interview I had was Phil Perry. Mm. And you realize that he then explained that he'd come out of music for several years suffering depression. Mm. Mm. But again, getting choked up because he was on tour mm. and he was in Chicago, I think, he said. And he was on his way to do this award ceremony, a yearly award ceremony at the Twin Towers. Well, it was 9-11. Wow. He was in Chicago, couldn't get any flights, obviously, mm. but there was no information. Mm. He then realizes that the place he's going to, mm. the friends he's going to meet and play with, were killed. And wow. that took its effect. Mm. So, you know, there's stories like that that just send chills down your spine. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, send chills down your spine. But, but really, I mean, Tom Brown. Mm. Funkin' for Jamaica. Mm, mm, yeah, funky, absolutely. Yeah. Funkin' for say, Jamaica. We saw your first album, you're holding the trumpet and you're sitting in a, uh, a cockpit of a plane. Mm. And I thought, you know, oh, you're just making style for the photo shoot. Mm. No, he's actually a pilot. He's Whoa. actually a pilot. So all the way through mm. lockdown, he mm. was working, delivering supplies. Mm. You know, so the, the, all those mm. stories. You don't exactly. You don't all know those. these things. You don't know these things. You don't. Know, you don't know what. And you don't know them things. unless you course, speak course, to them. Course. Yeah, absolutely. You know, these are the stories that need to be told. And as mm. I said, you know, I mm. think there are stories that mm. need to they be are. told mm. by the people mm. to somebody with sympathetic, empathic ears who are mm. Mm. or is mm. financially and emotionally involved. Mm. Mm. And, and really listen it to get the best out of them and celebrate them. The mm. stories need to be told. Mm, so I know good. the journey continues because mm. it's never ending, but mm. they mm. need to be told. And plus I wanted to use the handles that I have, Facebook, mm. Twitter, mm. Instagram, mm. to do something more than, mm. oh, this is a cute picture of me at mm. a party 
and oh, I was feeling good today in this suit, and I'm there. So this is me. But they, but they, but they do look cute, though. They do look cute. Everyone, so yeah, they do look cute. But you know, you're thinking if you've got that platform, try and mm. as well as your cute, put your cute mm. pictures up too. Mm. But try mm. and do something else. Mm. Something. Mm. So that was my personal thing. Mm. No, I'm not saying that's what anybody else should do, but mm. I just thought it's a platform to use for something positive mm. and inspirational. Of course, of course. Apart from just looking at my face going. Mm, mm, absolutely <laughs> you know so that's it no all right well so barry all i can say you seem to have okay. a, you, you seem to have had a blessed life regardless of whatever and you're still smiling you know so you are an example for us all especially for the people that are the viewers are going to watch this video okay so all I can say is thank you so much on behalf of across the view for taking this time out to this interview of us today and we wish you the best and and one last question. What's your plans for Christmas? You, you know my passion is food. So the cooking mm. starts tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> the cooking wow. starts tomorrow. Wow. And mm. it goes on until and everybody will just eat mm. and relax and chill out and enjoy food. I mean, you know, we did it in a time when it was fabulous. Three and four parties a night. We've mm. done that. Mm. You know, when we were free and we didn't have to mm. walk around with masks and, mm. you know, take tests and... Four, so parties, you know what? I'm four quite... parties, all night parties, all night parties for days and days. Yeah, you know, mm. there'll always be another party. And if there mm. isn't, we did it when it was the best. Mm. So right. we're not missing anything. I'm quite happy mm. to just simply sit down in my home and mm. and enjoy my home and mm. the peace and quiet for a few days and long Netflix, dog walks. Netflix? And... Netflix? Of course. I've got everything. <laughs> <The> Netflix, Prime, <laughs> whatever. You know, I've like... got everything. Series after series, it's all good. Exactly. I mean, when I get a yeah. break, I sit there and watch back to back four episodes of a program. I'm like, that's me letting my hair down. <laughs> you know what? No, I'm not crazy about series. The odd series I will watch, the odd series, mm. but really and truly, I like movies. Mm. I love movies and I love old movies. Mm. So, in between my break today, mm. Just before talking to you, I was mm. watching Jason and the Argonauts. That's oh, what I know Christmas has started. Wow. That's wow. what I know Christmas mm. has started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason yeah, yeah. and the Argonauts. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. So, yeah. Right. All right. Barry, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful Christmas and a Absolute happy New Year. pleasure. Honored to have been asked. Mm. Thank you for asking me to participate. I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to ask you again, because obviously I want to definitely next year, I want to ask you again at some time and ask you some more questions. Obviously, I think I'm going to go a little bit deeper next time. But thank you so much. Okay? It's, a, it's a great Ooh, Deeper? No deeper. naughty boy questions now. Come on. <laughs> no. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. All the yeah. best. And you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.